Good morning, everyone, and welcome and thanks for attending today's webinar, Suicide Contagion and Postvention, Responding Effectively. I'm Kathy Espinoza with Keenan and Associates, and I'll be serving as your host today. As we noted on the earlier slide, the audio portion of your phones has been muted so we can keep the background noise to a minimum. We've got quite a few people on our webinar this morning. Our topic for today will be covered in about 50 minutes, and that gives us plenty of time at the end to, have to address any questions you have on this topic. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to send me your question using the chat feature in the bottom right corner of the screen, and I'll do my best to answer as many questions as we have time for. Please note we are recording the webinar this morning so that it will be available for playback in a few days, we will post it on our PNC Bridge. All right, it is 10.01, and I'd, I'm very happy to have Dr. Scott Poland with us today. Scott Poland is the Path Prevention Division Director for the American Association of Suicidology, and his first book was entitled Suicide Intervention in the Schools. He's helped a lot of school systems and communities respond to the tragedy of youth suicide. He was also a reviewer for the Postvention Toolkit for Schools, and that's available on the Suicide Prevention Resource Center website. Okay, Dr. Scott Poland, I'm going to hand the ball over to you for your fabulous webinar. Thank you very much, Kathy, and indeed it's my pleasure to have a chance to talk today about such an important topic, and I compliment everyone for tuning in. I think everybody who is listening realizes what a tremendous problem youth suicide is. Uh, I personally believe that there are lots of clusters that have gone undetected in communities around the country that, unfortunately, communities and schools are often slow to recognize what's happening and slow to provide the really important leadership. The word cluster and contagion has been a little bit confusing to school personnel, and really contagion, which is the way that suicidal imitation seems to be transferred, there's a lot, frankly, that we don't know about that. We're gonna to talk today about the influence of media uh, with regards to contagion. We do know that actual clusters have occurred, and they've really occurred all around the country, and as I said earlier, often schools and communities are really slow to recognize that we have a cluster that's happening. And in today's world, with all the technology and the social network, young people that have significant mental health problems often find each other. And very importantly, with regard to the prevention, we need to be able to help young people buffer the effects of negative events like the suicide of another young person in their community. In fact, when a suicide does occur, it's literally like we've thrown a rock into a pond and we have the ripple effect in the schools, the churches, and the communities. And what we really need are healthy families, connections for kids, and a lot of protective factors to make sure that we don't have further suicide. In the literature, you'll find estimates that once one youth suicide has occurred, that the chances of a, another one have gone up a very significant amount. And as we look at, you know, our next slide, as we look at mass clusters, those are really believed to be media-related. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about what are the things that the media should or should not do with regards to coverage of a youth suicide? And essentially, the less coverage of a suicide, the better. The more emphasis on where there's help in the school and community, that is what we really want the stories to be about. And this term, Werther Effect, has actually been around for a couple of centuries. There was a book in German a number of years ago about the sorrows of young Werther. And after that book was read by lots of young people in Germany and Austria, unfortunately, suicides increased. They also documented in Austria that 
after one young person had stepped in front of a subway, all of a sudden more and more young people were using that particular method. So the media does have a role to play here. And let's look at what are the things in the next slide that we want the media to avoid. And sometimes I will use this example. And the example I'm about to give you really pretty much violates all of these guidelines. The headline in the newspaper in Missouri said, and by the way, it was front page, picture of a beautiful girl. The headline said, popular Ozark student falls to dark and lonely thoughts. So it was definitely a mystic and a romantic newspaper headline. It described in great detail exactly how she died by suicide. And I would like to take a, a moment and say that survivors of suicide, of which there are millions in this country, we very much prefer the term died by to the term committed. And just know that a survivor will say something like, you commit a robbery. Don't tell me that my loved one committed suicide. They died by suicide. Just that term seems to imply that there were lots and lots of factors involved, like mental health problems, perhaps substance abuse, lots of relationship difficulties. So, but back to the newspaper article from Missouri. It described that she got her best dress cleaned. It was black, of course. She picked it up at the cleaners. She drove to the holodome. She ordered her Coke. She dropped her cyanide tablet in the Coke, and she fell dead to the floor. And the last sentence in the article was, she was just too sensitive for this tough world of ours. And first of all, we can never give any kid the message that they're too sensitive and they can't make it in this world. In fact, the message has to be with help with coming forward and getting help for you and your friends and with mental health services and with greater support from your school, community, and parents, that things are so very hopeful. So basically that newspaper article pretty much is everything about what not to do because it was a romantic headline. It did give specific details about how she died. It even implied some simplistic explanations, and it's also very important that the media not glamorize when a celebrity has died by suicide, because that does have an effect. Now let's go on and look at other media reporting guidelines. So as we were talking about earlier, we don't want to oversimplify, and we really want to try not to overstate the frequency of suicide. And we would never want to refer to it as using the term committed, much prefer died by. And we don't want to talk about a suicide in any way being a success. So it's important to keep those things in mind. And obviously, we want the media coverage to be very small, back page if at all. We want the coverage to always be about how to get help if you or someone you know is suicidal. And one of my favorite examples, you know, I, I worked as a director of psychological services for the third largest district in Texas for 24 years. And I'm very sorry to tell you that during that 24 years, 42 of our enrolled students died by suicide. Frankly, I don't think anybody else was keeping track. I don't think anybody wanted to keep track. and. I think it's important that we know the extent of this problem and we continually try to improve our suicide prevention and postvention efforts. I presented to some teachers the other day right here in South Florida and one of them said, you know, I've been at the high school six years. I know at least three of our students have died by suicide at this high school and yet no one has ever talked to me about what to look for and what to do. And please know that postvention very much provides opportunities not to just help young people with their shock, grief, and confusion, but it provides an opportunity to prevent further suicides, to teach them what to do, how to help yourself, and how to help your friends. So my example going back to the district in Houston is 
the media wanted to cover a suicide where a young man had jumped from a high-rise building. And when they came out and met with me, I convinced them, don't cover this death. What you need to do is do a story about suicide prevention and emphasize all the things we're trying to do in the district, all the things we're trying to do in the community. And perhaps one of the key things that I hope that the listeners will take from today's webinar is work in partnership with communities, agencies, and national resources as we all work hard to prevent further suicides. So if we look at the next slide about point clusters, those are ones that they occur close in space and time. And as I said earlier, with social media connections, the impact of a suicide is much greater than ever before. We tend to think in terms of, well, let's look at the effect on this one school, when in reality, the young person may have had connections throughout the entire community. They may have, have friends that attended other middle or high schools. Uh, there may be lots of things being posted on the social network sites. And one of the key things that school personnel can do is meet with good, responsible kids and talk with them about, can you just share with me what kind of things are being said and posted about this particular death. And here's a statement from the literature about most of the point cluster victims after we look in retrospect. And actually, the term today and the American Association of Suicidology has done a number of what are called autopsy studies, which means in the aftermath of youth suicides, especially clusters, they will be invited into a community they will get the permission of parents to interview friends and to talk with family and really try to look towards what could we learn, what could prevent further suicide. And as we look at why postvention in the schools, it's, it's really pretty obvious. Schools are the place where kids are, basically, for half of the days of the year. And if you'll excuse me for trying to add just a, a, a slight a bit of humor, there was an infamous bank robber. His name was Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton spent most of his life in jail because he kept robbing banks every time he got out. As an old man, Willie was being interviewed, and they said, Willie, why do you keep robbing all those banks? And he said, the answer is really simple. That's where they keep all the money. And what I believe is the mental health services must be provided in schools because that's where the kids are every single day of the school year. And having worked in those schools, when somebody says something about like 80% of the mental health services a kid in this country receives, they get it at school, well, in a way that sounds pretty good until you start looking at what few social workers, school counselors, and school psychologists we actually have in ratio to the large numbers of students. But So the real question is, how do we promote mental health in our schools? And the Center, uh, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center lists a number of reasons why suicide prevention needs to happen at school, and it talks specifically about how upset people in schools are when a suicide occurs, how difficult it is to concentrate on the academics, and that schools are the logical place to make sure that everybody gets help for their shock, grief, and confusion. You know, in being in classrooms after a suicide has occurred, kids often ask questions. And of course, yeah, I believe it is very important to tell the truth. And sometimes school administrators will be like, well, we're not sure whether it was a suicide or not. And my response would be, let's find out. Let's get in the car. Let's drive to the home. Let's interact with the parents. Let's offer support. And by the way, most of the time, there are surviving siblings. And I remember on one occasion, the parents opened the door to the principal and I, and they were very sad because 
their high school daughter, who was a senior, had died by suicide, and then they said, we want you, Dr. Poland, to meet her surviving sister. She's one year younger. She goes to the same high school, and she is going to need a lot of help. And they were actually very concerned with how can you help our surviving daughter? How can you help our deceased daughter's friends? So when schools aren't sure what's happened, they really need to go to the family and talk with the family about how important it is to just tell the truth, acknowledge what's happened, and when we're able to tell the truth to the other students, then we can really honestly help them with all of their feelings and we can work on suicide prevention at our school. So back to a couple of things students will sometimes say. They'll want to know, why did she do it? My answer is this simple. We're never going to know exactly why she did what she did. I'm here to help you. You lost a friend. You lost a classmate. How can we all work hard to make sure everybody gets the help we need uh, and to make sure that we don't have further suicides? They're also going to ask, how did she do it? In my personal opinion, and you'll find this in the postvention toolkit, is tell the truth. We don't have to dwell on explicit details, but it's best to just simply tell the truth that she hung herself or, unfortunately, she shot herself. And then there's often going to be a lot of discussions about religion. And by the way, I don't claim to be a religious expert, but I want to share with the listeners something that I've heard a number of ministers say that I found very helpful. You're all wondering why God didn't stop her. God sounded the alarm, but God couldn't stop her. God has embraced her, yes. She's in whatever afterlife you believe in. But God did not choose her at the age of 13 to die by suicide. God is actually saddened that she didn't stay on this earth and do God's work over her natural lifetime. All I can say is I like that approach. It basically says, embraced in terms of whatever you believe in, but that God does not choose adolescents to die by suicide. And I'll contrast that with going to a funeral of yet another suicide victim. She was a high school student. There were about 800 students at her funeral. And, of course, you're wondering, where are all the parents? And basically, literature says, the more the funeral for suicide victims can be after school or in the evening or on Saturday, the more we can prepare students for funerals and what to expect, and most importantly, how do we get their parents to accompany them to funerals. But the member of that particular denomination, I'll never forget his exact words to these 800 grieving students. He said, her burdens were so great. Because her burdens were so great, she had to come to God. If your burdens ever become great, you too must come to God. And it was frustrating because the member of the clergy had an opportunity to promote prevention, to promote connections, to promote resiliency, to promote suicide crisis hotlines, and they did not take advantage of that opportunity. I'd like to move on to uh, a couple of other points, and I've already talked about the importance of assisting survivors in the grief process is very important. Providing accurate information while minimizing the risk to suicide contagion. Implement ongoing prevention efforts. I once had a young man say, I sat next to her. Does that mean I'm going to be the next suicide victim? And the literature says very strongly, these discussions that I'm sharing examples about, they should be in classrooms or in small groups or individually. I very much caution all the listeners, don't have an assembly in the aftermath of a suicide. Talk to kids in classrooms and small groups. So they'll ask questions like the one I just mentioned. And, of course, 
It's not something that you catch because you sat next to someone. However, when it really happens, then it very much is on the mind. One time a school counselor says to me, well, you know, now that the suicide happened, I've already been talking with nine kids in the ninth grade this year that I believe to be suicidal. Do you think I should check in with them today since the suicide has actually happened? Obviously, the answer to that question is yes. It's going to be much more on their mind. They may in some way view their life as parallel to the victim. They may think I had all the problems he or she had and even more. So, telling the truth, accurate information, how to help yourself, how to help your friends, promoting the crisis hotline number that's available 24 hours a day, 1-800-SUICIDE. I remember being in a classroom at a high school the day after a suicide, and I asked these 30 students how many of them knew that there was a 24-hour crisis hotline you could call every moment of the day. One kid out of 30 raised her hand. That happened to be my own daughter. So what can we do in schools? Make sure that we have posters and cards and numbers on bulletin boards, and we talk with kids about 1-800-SUICIDE. doesn't matter where you are in this country. You are connected with the nearest crisis hotline. Well, moving on, let's look a little bit more specifically at contagion. The literature, and really all it is, is an estimate. One to five percent of all youth suicides in this country are the result of clusters. My own belief are that because of underreporting and lack of recognition of clusters, I suspect the figure would actually be higher than one to five percent. So as we look at the potential risk factors, so it really has to do with the stressors that young people are under and whether or not they have a good support system. I already talked about adolescents with similar problems are likely to find each other. And there's been research trying to pinpoint what are the factors that might be present in communities that have experienced clusters. There's a lot we don't know, but lack of belonging, little awareness of suicide as a problem, substance abuse problems, rapid growth in the school and communities are all believed to be factors. So as we look at other key points on the next slide, youth suicide occurs in a context of an active, and it's very important that we understand a treatable mental illness. That's what we're finding in these autopsy studies that depression in particular has gone undetected and untreated. And the general thinking is for a suicide to actually occur, lots of things have to go wrong at the same time. Most adolescent suicides actually occur at home in the evening when somebody else is in the house, I actually believe a lot of adolescents have exhibited warning signs and they're really hoping that someone figures, them, figures out what they're thinking and actually stops them. And worldwide, the research basically says two things are going to prevent adolescent suicides. Remove the lethal weapon or method, which in America basically is removing the gun from the ready access of a suicidal young person. Second thing is education for all concerned about what to look for and what to do. And I'd like to share a recent phone consultation. I think somebody actually twisted the principal's arm to get him to call me. And he's basically, his school had experienced four suicides in a single school year. And he's saying, why is everybody focusing on these suicides? Why can't they recognize all the good things that are going on at the high school? Well, I tried to listen very patiently and assured him I knew that there were many good things going on at his school. But really, everybody is worried and everybody is looking to see what's the school and community 
going to do to prevent further suicides. There's actually a quote out there saying, no single entity or agency alone can stop a suicide cluster. It really takes a village. It takes school leaders, community leaders, mental health, law enforcement, survivor groups, medical professionals, all working together. So my response really was that we've got to have a task force in place in your school and community. And yes, I wish that every student in this country would recognize how beautiful every day is and it's a gift. But I, I know that's not the way many of them think. And it's very important that we offer them the help that they need. And of course, the principal, we consulted quite a bit and he called back a second time. And this next slide talks about his question about a scholarship. One of the parents of a suicide victim wanted a scholarship in their name. And he's like, I want to turn that down. In fact, he actually sent me a copy of the media guidelines as his rationale. And I was explaining, well, really, I think it, it would be appropriate to have a scholarship in memory. And you simply make an announcement. And then we got to what he was really concerned about. He was concerned that in some ceremony, he was going to have to hand the microphone to grieving parents who were going to tell a long, sad story. And I said, don't hand them a microphone. Just simply thank the Johnson family for the scholarship in memory of their son, and then go on and thank the Smith family for the scholarship in memory of their son, who maybe died in a car accident, and just accept the scholarships. And I'm really excited that the SPRC and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in the spring of 2011 produced the Postvention Toolkit for Schools because it provides an excellent guide and it answers many of these difficult questions. And as we go on and we really, in the next couple of slides, we're going to look at what's called circles of vulnerability, which we really could apply to virtually any tragedy that affects a school. Basically, if we move to the geographic proximity, the question really is, who was nearby when the suicide death occurred? Sadly, there could have been somebody else present uh, who was in the house, maybe even in the same room, somebody who could have been nearby. So as you look at the geographic proximity on the very next slide, that's basically telling us about the question of where somebody was located in terms of when the death occurred, regardless of what was the cause of death. We look at the next slide, which is entitled Psychosocial Proximity. That really has to do with who was the closest to the victim. And obviously, the immediate family would be the closest. Then everybody has close friends or a best friend. And that's how you apply the psychosocial proximity. If we look at the next one, which is very important also, it's population at risk. Basically, every kid in every school in America has their own unique history with regards to trauma and loss. And I personally believe that teachers and especially counselors need to know more information about the losses and tragedies that young people have experienced. And someone may have lost another friend, or they may have lost a father or an uncle to suicide, for example, and that is going to make things much more difficult. And really, the key point is the overlap of these three. And Kathy, if you were to go back to the circles of vulnerability, which would be back three slides, what I'd like all the listeners to be thinking about is, wow, was there somebody who was nearby when the suicide occurred? Did they happen to be the best friend or the sibling of the deceased? And what have been the other losses or tragedies in their life? And if everyone would think of this as sort of like a psychological triage, how might we have 
some kind of a systematic approach to try to figure out who is going to need our help the most. And I think this is a, a very good way to approach it. Now, if we go forward a number of slides, let's look at right in Palo Alto. We had a cluster that occurred and five students, I think all of them attended Gunn High School, died by suicide. Many of them jumped in front of trains. And there's really a wonderful quote from one of the giants in the field of suicide prevention, really emphasizing they died from untreated, undertreated psychiatric illness. It's not a mysterious thing. These suicides are preventable. And it's a misperception that once someone, particularly a young person, wants to die by suicide, they're always wanting to die by suicide. There's a pretty impulsive characteristic to making the actual attempt, even though they may have been thinking about it for a while. And the intervention of any one person, and most importantly, it's how do we get the students themselves to know how to come forward and get help for their friends. If we look at the next slide, it's from a short article that was written about the Gunn High School cluster. And they did a lot of communicating in the school, a lot of meetings to determine who was at risk. They spent a lot of time on follow-up and reviewing how students were doing. They gathered information from suicide prevention and postvention experts. They kept all lines of communication open to stakeholders. And they made changes in terms of trying to make sure that the students all felt the sense of belonging. They all knew how much the teachers and all the staff cared about them. They did a lot to improve school climate and build relationship between kids and all of the school staff. And it's really important that schools do something in the aftermath of a suicide. There was some research out there and some articles a number of years ago that a lot of administrators used to interpret and make the conclusion, oh, we might make this worse. We might dramatize and glorify, therefore we should do nothing. Well, there's been no recommendations in the last decade that say do nothing. Everything says do something. Put the emphasis on the living sources of assistance for all concerned, making sure everybody knows the warning signs, what to look for, and what to do. And the next slide has to do with answering student questions. And I really pretty much answered the first three of those. Is there someone or something to blame? There's actually a great quote in the literature that I could cite verbatim, but it really summarized. It's like everything, everyone, everyone's fault, yet it was no one's fault, and it shouldn't have happened. So it's pretty much every experience, everything that happened to the young person's life, yet it still shouldn't have happened. And we prevent further suicides by education. And very importantly, in the aftermath, and I'm going to speak very honestly here, one suicide at the school, not much gets done. Second suicide in the school and community, probably not much gets done. I actually find that schools have a very short memory. It often takes a third or a fourth suicide that affects the exact same school, and all of a sudden, the resistance the administration has to suicide prevention is lessened. I'm actually a very big fan of Signs of Suicide, the SOS program. And lots of information is available at mentalhealthscreening.org. SOS has two components, a very well done video that empowers everybody about what to look for and what to do, how to help a suicidal classmate or friend. The second part is the short questionnaire that kids fill out themselves. They turn it over and score it, and it tells them whether or not 
they need to see a mental health professional today. The resistance to depression screening, like SOS and teen screen, is greatly lessened in the aftermath of multiple suicides. But those programs are both listed as evidence-based. We don't have to wait for multiple suicides to be able to know that we need to be doing more in our schools. Let's look at the very next slide about the U.S. Prevention Task Force. If you were to ask me my greatest frustration about suicide prevention and postvention in schools, it would be the failure of the medical community to get involved. I've been invited to eight different communities that have experienced clusters. Every single time, I've been disappointed by the response of physicians. My recommendation is really simple. When we have youth suicides that occur in a town, every kid who sees the doctor for any reason should be questioned about suicidal thoughts and plans. And there you have the national recommendation about screening. And that instrument should be scored before the adolescent leaves the office. The medical community has ignored these national recommendations. Very next slide has to do with recommendations. And I've already talked a little bit about some of these points, but we need postvention policies. We need to work with the community resources. We need that partnership. We need to have information available for parents so they know what to look for and what to do. And we need to pay attention to the postvention toolkit for schools. These next couple of slides, and I'm only going to highlight a couple of things about these next couple of slides. This was a cluster that I responded to in Sarpy County, Nebraska. And the listeners can look at the first slide has to do with some characteristics about the county. Let's look at the next slide. It's basically going to say nine teens died in 26 months in a not a very populated county. One of the superintendents basically very honestly said, we didn't realize what was happening. Took that newspaper article in the Omaha paper before we realized, wow, we got a cluster going on. Now, to his credit, he looked for national resources. They formed a task force. Lots of things were implemented. And thankfully, all of the suicides stopped. They also got a federal grant from the U.S. Department of Education, Project Serve. They got more counselors, and they implemented SOS. And this next slide is going to really look at the literature. The postvention toolkit is very important. Who might be most at risk? Well, basically, we'll look at imitative factors in just a moment. So let's go on to the steps taken in Sarpy County, Nebraska, so everybody can see those. Extensive consultation, community forums, presentation to all of the school employees, a parent presentation, intensive training for staff and administrators, implemented SOS, got a Project Serve grant, presentation at the state meeting for parents, which was hosted in Sarpy County a few months later. So I want to just give you an example on the this slide about I conducted the parent meeting, and I really talked about more than just suicide. In fact, I want to suggest to everybody that I have learned to title meetings for parents a little bit broader than suicide prevention. You call it suicide prevention only, and I'm unfortunately going to say not many parents are going to show up. You call it building success, fostering resiliency, safeguarding students, raising children in today's crazy world, and you can talk about suicide prevention and all of the other things that are so important in terms of protective factors, resiliency, the importance of parents being involved in their children's lives, doing something about substance abuse, and removing access to firearms when we know 
a young person is depressed. Very next slide will just emphasize it takes a village as you look at all of the different people that are listed there. I already cited my key frustration, the medical community not stepping forward. These next two slides are going to look at imitative factors. And these came directly from the Center for Disease Control. So the question is, did somebody back out of a suicide pact? Were they supposed to die with he or she? It's rare, but it does happen. Or did somebody have a last negative interaction? One of the tragedies I responded to, I'm really sorry to tell you, that five kids admitted they told her, Saturday night, it's a night, you're supposed to die. Here's where to put the gun, pull the trigger, it'll be quick, it won't hurt. I suspect that those five students are going to remember that last negative interaction for the rest of their lives. Somebody else didn't have a negative interaction, but they realized she was trying to tell me. She wrote me that note. She gave me her prized possessions. She was acting so different and strange, I should have figured it out. And if we look at the next one, it really has to do with maybe there were no warning signs. You certainly didn't encourage a suicide, but you lost your best friend. But then the thing that's perhaps the hardest for schools and communities to understand, the next potential victim need not even to have known the suicide victim. They just know what she did. And it's back to that ripple effect. And again, they may be thinking, I have all those problems and I have a lot more. So it's important, again, that we emphasize prevention for everybody. And we know when somebody has a history of severe mental health problems and prior suicidal behavior. Next slide really is sort of a restatement of what we've talked about earlier. It takes a village. Again, it comes directly from the Center for Disease Control. We need to have planning meetings. It needs to be the school and the community working together. We need to deliver a public response that emphasizes help for all concerned, but doesn't sensationalize or glorify the deaths by suicide. Now I want to specifically call your attention to the postvention toolkit. And the overriding recommendation for this is strive to treat all the deaths the same, which means what have we done when we had a student die of an illness? What have we done when we had a student die in a car accident? Let's look at that and that we're basically, we'll try to do as close as possible to that. I've already address several of the other points that are on this slide and emphasize, and you have to do this tactfully, that suicide is very much involved with mental health problems and mental illness. We may never know all of the factors involved, but we do know that mental illness is often the most significant factor in youth suicide. And by the way, I'm always cautioning everybody don't make a sweeping conclusion based on what you know or think you know about one case. We have approximately 4,000 youth suicides a year. When we talk about it, we want to look for something that's happening hundreds or even thousands of times. Moving on, looking at the toolkit, it stresses what I said earlier. Go right to the family, get the facts. We cannot wait. What if they say, we don't want the cause of death disclosed? Well, I'm going to be as persuasive as I possibly can to explain by telling the truth, we're going to be able to prevent further suicides. This is really best practices, et cetera. But maybe they don't give me permission. Well, in that postvention toolkit, you actually have sample letters. Here's one of them that I really like. The family has asked that we not disclose the cause of death of their child. However, we do know that youth suicide is the third leading cause of death for young people in this country. 
And it's always important for all of us to know what to look for and what to do. So we're not really violating what they've requested of us, but we are taking the opportunity to teach suicide prevention. And of course, very important to prepare the faculty first so that they will have some idea about how to respond to students. I've also been in situations where I actually talked with the funeral director about moving the funeral after school or in the evening so parents can be there with their children. The next slide talks about a point I made earlier. Tell the truth. Have meetings for parents. First part, general information. Second part, providing small group discussions with trained crisis counselors. And of course, linking with community services. All these are right out of these recommendations, which I believe are the most complete post recommendations that have ever come out. Notice that it says, trying to forbid and prohibit all memorials is a problem. Strike a balance between the needs of distraught students and fulfilling the primary purpose of education. Spontaneous memorials, they're here to stay. We need to respect them, leave them around for a time, take digital pictures of them, and realize this is one of the ways that students express themselves. And small towns sometimes have held the funeral for a suicide victim at the school during the school day. This to be, is to be avoided as much as possible. So I'm going to move on to very quickly just know that you have some additional slides that are going to help you in post pension situations. Notice it talked about key points in terms of suicide involves mental illness. Schools are often very sad. There's lots of emotionality. We need to offer support. And we need trained and empowered counselors and teachers to offer that support. And we talked earlier about the issue of talking about mental health problems, and perhaps the simplest thing to do is to emphasize we're never going to know everything about why he or she did what they did. We do know a lot about youth suicide, and we know that mental health problems are a very significant part of this. So these next couple of slides have to do with the suicide postvention checklist, and I don't think it's necessary for me to go through all of those because we've talked about a lot of those points, but it really begins with verify what's happened. Tell the truth. Mobilize your crisis team. Ask, assess the impact on the school. Use those circles of vulnerabilities. Determine how and what information you're going to share. Identify who is the most affected, and look at memorials. And hopefully we can guide students to what I believe is the best type of memorial, doing something in memory of the deceased. Start a chapter of Yellow Ribbon. Promote the teen crisis line. Get kids trained to man the phones at the crisis line. And what I hope is that when schools sadly experience a suicide, they look at all aspects of future prevention, intervention efforts, and how, if it ever happens again, can we provide more support for our students and all of our staff. And the last slide really says, the journey through postvention begins and ends with prevention. And there are a couple of slides at the end listing some of the excellent national resources and Obviously, the American Association of Suicidology, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, funded by our federal government, and evidence-based practices and best practices are listed there. And SPRC and AFSP partnered to produce the post pension toolkit. I'd encourage every listener to go online get a copy of the Postvention Toolkit. 
know about it, and use it, sadly, should you ever have a suicide. The last slide is really about how to contact me and the suicide prevention office that I co-direct here at Nova Southeastern University. And I think that we have time for a few questions. Well, thank you very much, Scott. That was, unfortunately, it, it was a good topic and it's very timely. <sighs> um, I do have one question for you. Um, as most of the people on our webinar this morning are school districts, uh, what do you feel is the most important step that a school can take in the aftermath of a student suicide? I believe they need a copy of the postvention toolkit. They need to sit around the table with the key administrator, school counselor, school psychologist, social worker, key administrators, maybe a lead teacher or two, and they need to make a plan, which basically, and they need to make the plan quickly. And that's where this verify, tell the truth, review the guidelines, the post pension toolkit is about 45 pages long. Of course, what I would hope is that everybody listening would review the post pension toolkit, would sit down, make a plan with administrators now. I find, being honest, that often administrators are a bit reluctant to plan and they're thinking somehow we're never going to have a suicide. Oh, okay, we had one. Oh, it's never going to happen again. And we really do need to be prepared. And it's an excellent resource. Great. Um, we have another question. What is the best way to go about assembling a community task force? Well, we like to see, I like to see dis, district-wide initiatives. What I basically believe is that this entire area of suicide prevention, intervention, postvention, it shouldn't be a site-based and a school-based issue. Basically, the superintendent and the school board should take action. And a number of states, you know, have implemented legislation really requiring schools to have plans in this area. So first of all, I hope whatever we're doing is district-wide, and then district-wide personnel meet with mental health center director, uh, lead physicians, uh, lead clergy in the community, and really get those key personnel, including the survivor group personnel, around the table. Often survivor group leaders say things like, we've gone to the school over and over. They shut us out. They never let us talk to anyone. But survivors, particularly programs like Yellow Ribbon, they have a great deal of expertise that I can offer to the school and the community. So it's get an initiative going that's district-wide and then reach out and utilize your community resources to do something about youth suicide. Excellent. Excellent advice, Scott. Now remember, Keenan Safe Schools, uh, we've got a school safety center on our PNC bridge and we do have the Suicide Prevention Resource Center has allowed us to post many of the wallet cards that can be given to students, many of their educational materials, but it has links into many of the sites and programs that Scott mentioned on this webinar. So be sure to go into that and check out the School Safety Center tab. Scott, I want to thank you very, very much for joining us, and thank you to all of you who have attended our webinar this morning with Keenan and Associates, and I look forward to providing other webinars, future webinars on similar topics. Thank you very much, Scott, for joining us today. It's my pleasure, and I compliment everyone for tuning in on such an important topic. Thank you all.